Right, so welcome everyone to this third lecture. Um, so what are we going to do today? We are going to do a bunch of stuff. Right, so yesterday we looked at two specific applications of the, the product structure theorem, namely bounding the Q numbers of planar graphs and bounding the non-repetitive chromatic numbers. And we spent essentially the whole lecture, you know, looking very closely at how can we uh, uh, control what's happening when we take the strong product of our graph with a path. Right? And the idea, you know, it, but there were some technical details, but the idea was to really see uh, in detail how to um, handle such situations in some uh, specific cases. So what I'm going to do today is, uh, is quite different. I'm going to take a much higher level and give you a kind of a broad overview of all the things that have been done. So we are going to look at some more applications. There are a bunch of them here. But in each case, you know, I will just tell you what was the problem, what has been done. Uh, but we are not really going to look at, at the proofs. Uh, a couple of them, we are going to revisit them in the exercise session. But we are not really going to do proofs uh, in this lecture here for these applications. Uh, but before looking at these applications, I'm going to try and give you a bit more context about the product structure theorem. So the way I try to introduce it on Monday is I, I, I try to, to, um, to give you a picture of the product structure theorem as a natural evolution of the ideas behind product partitions with small flatness. When you looked at, in particular, at these uh, proofs for planar graphs, if the, the ideas of these proofs, they somehow naturally lead to the, this tripod decomposition. And so that's how I, I try to introduce it here. But there are connections um, with also with other classical themes, in particular with uh, separators and with the so-called Baker uh, technique, Baker layering technique for planograms. So I will spend uh, you know, the, the beginning of the lecture trying to show you what these connections are, because this, is, this gives you another viewpoint of what uh, the product structure theorem is doing. And uh, lastly, in the last part of the, the lecture, we are going to, s to look at other graph classes that also have a product structure theorem. Uh, all these graph classes, they are pretty close to planar graphs in a sense, and the proofs always follow the same strategy. First, you find a way to reduce from your graph to a planar graph. You apply the product structure theorem on that planar graph, and then you lift it back to the, the original graph that you were looking at. Right, so we are going to look at graphs on surfaces, graphs that forbid an apex graph as a minor. I'm going to define that when we are going to look at it. Um, a variant of this, and also at k planar graphs. But all these graphs are somehow close to being planar, and the strategy is always to reduce to planar graphs first, and then to lift the product structure theorem back to that uh, graph class. Okay, so that's what we are going to do today. So, you know, it's more like a, a an overview kind of uh, lecture today. Um, okay, so, oh yes, first, a small remark about yesterday's lecture. So if you remember, at the end of the lecture yesterday, there was a very good question from uh, one of you asking essentially the following. We've seen a proof for the bounding the Q number of planar graphs, and the best bound I mentioned was 49 from the, the original paper. And the question was essentially, well, you know, in that proof, you only look at the product structure. You forget that the graph is planar. You just look at the product structure. And the question was, well, can't you do like a little bit better if you try to use the fact that the graph is planar and try to use that some of the edges of the product are not there? That was essentially the question. I didn't have a satisfying answer, but then Piotr suggested that there was a paper doing exactly that. So I looked it up, and indeed, uh, they, they, they get a bound of 42, so that's the ben, best known bound right now. And it's exactly what they do in the proof. They use the tripod decomposition. And they look at the tripod decomposition instead of looking at the product structure. And they try to be smarter about the way they, they build the, um, the ordering for, uh, for your graph so that you don't have big rainbows. And so they can shave off a bit 
the bound from 49 to 42. At the end of the paper, they even mentioned that they, they believe they can do 39, but then they wrote down 42. So that's, that's the status of the, this problem so far. There is a published proof of 42, and the worst example we know has Q number 4. Right, so it's between 4 and, and 42. Okay, so that was a remark about yesterday's uh, lecture. So now let me start a bit with discussing separators. So what is the separator for me for this lecture and for um, tomorrow's lecture, because we are going to use it tomorrow as well. Uh, a separator for me, it's a subset of vertices, so that when you remove it, you can group the connected components into two sets, each of which has size at most two thirds n, where n is the number of vertices of the original prime. And that's what I will call a separator. And uh, we are going to use uh, some basic facts about separators. I'm, I'm, I guess that most of you know these facts, but since you know, I, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page, let me quickly go over it. This will take only five minutes. Well, the first basic fact, fundamental fact about trees, is that there is always a vertex, which is a separator, if you, if you look at it as a vertex subset. And one way to see that quickly, well, you have your end vertex tree, look at any edge in your tree, and you can orient that edge towards the bigger half. If it's tied, you just orient it arbitrarily. And then, in this orientation, you have a sink, a vertex where all the edges are oriented towards it. If all the edges are oriented towards that sink, it means that when you remove that sink, all the connected components you get, the half size at most n over 2, because the edges were oriented towards this. Right, so you find a vertex where uh, when you remove it, every connected component has size at most n over 2. And well, you are essentially done then, because you can uh, just uh, re, uh, reshuffle these connected components into two sets of size at most 2 thirds n. Again, this is a completely standard argument. Let me quickly go over it. How do you do it? Well, list the connected components you get after the removal of your separator by non-increasing order of size. Okay. And now let's take a prefix of these connected components as big as possible, but of size at most 2 thirds n. This will be a non-empty prefix, you know, because every connected component has size at most n over 2. So you will definitely take at least one such component. And you'll take, you know, largest such prefix, and this will be one side, and whatever is left is the other side. So what you're taking here definitely has size at most two thirds n, because, you know, that's part of the definition of your prefix. What about the second part? Does it have size at most two thirds n? To see that it has size at most two thirds n, equivalently, we can check that whatever we took in the first part has size at least one third n. So why is that true? Well, imagine that it doesn't have size uh, at least one third n. So it has size strictly less than one third n. Then look at the first set that you did not take. That set has size at most the size of the previous set. So in particular, that set has size at most the total size of whatever you take, you took. Okay? So if you took less than one third n here, that set has size less than one third n. But then you could add it to your prefix, right? You have less than one third n, and then one, less than one third n, you could add it, and you have less than one um, than two third n. So that would be a contradiction. Okay? So the conclusion is that, well, you took at least one third n of the uh, of the Okay, so this way you rearrange your connected components and you do get that your vertex V is a separator of the tree. You're all happy with that lemma? Yeah? Okay. Uh, why do I mention that? Well, uh, we are going to use it, uh, but it implies almost directly that uh, if you have true with K, you have a separator of size at most uh, K plus one. Uh, we are going to use the fact that there is a separator of size big O of k, but you know, it's, it's uh, k plus 1. And so why do you get that? So again, this is one of these very basic properties of 3D compositions, but since we are going to use it, let me make sure that 
the proof is clear. So this is a consequence of the previous lemma because we are going to run the previous proof on the tree indexing the tree decomposition. And the previous proof will point towards a node of that tree that you should remove. And now we are going, we are going to look at the corresponding bag of that node. And that bag, which has size at most of tree read plus one, will be your separator. But that's the idea of the proof. So let me just do it really quickly to make sure that this is clear. So now you have a graph G, and you have some tree decomposition of your graph. And Let's take the, the view where you have bags. So you have some set of bags for every uh, nodes in your tree. Right? And these bags are subsets of vertices of uh, your property. OK. Now look at the tree T indexing your tree decomposition. And we are also going to orient the edges right or left, but what do we do? How do we do it now? Well, when you look at the edge of your tree, you look at the corresponding two bags, Bx and By, and you look at their intersection, right? So you look at the vertices of G, which are in Bx and which are in By, in the bags of X and in the bags of Y remove these uh, vertices, right? So these are the vertices that live both here and here. Remove them from the graph. Now when you look at the connected components uh, in the graph that's left, each connected component will live either on the left or on the right. Why is that? Well, imagine that a connected component has a vertex which appears in a bag here and in a bag there, then by the definition of a tree decomposition, that vertex should appear in a set of bags which defines a connected subgraph of your tree. So it should go through that edge. Right, so that does not happen. Right, so, uh, and, and more generally, if you take two vertices of a connected component, even if they are distinct, there is a path in between them. And by the same argument, you would find if one is on one side and the other is on the other side, you would find a vertex that appears on both uh, bags. Okay, so every connected component lives on one of the two sides. And now you again count how many vertices live on the left, how many vertices live on the right, and you orient towards the bigger half. Right? And then you run exactly the same in the previous argument here. In, in the tree, let's see your tree decomposition, you find a node. Uh, so that all the edges are oriented towards it. You remove the corresponding bag, and then you can check that every connected component that's has, that is left has size at most n over 2. Okay. I'm, I'm going a bit fast, but you know, that's the idea of the, the proof. Does that make sense? Or, yeah? Okay. So the point is that if you, know, if you have a tree decomposition of which um, of with k, then uh, there is always a bag which is a separator, and that bag has size at most k plus one. All right. Uh, in some sense, and this is something that, that we are going to revisit uh, tomorrow, uh, having small tree read and having small separators up to constant factors, this is essentially the same. So why do I say essentially? Okay. So let me be precise about what I mean. So if you have tree with k. Then you have a small separator, separator of size at most k plus 1. But if you have to read k, then this is a monotone property in the sense that well, all your subgraphs, they have to read at most k as well. Right? Because if you have a 3D composition of a graph, that's a 3D composition of all your subgraphs. Right? So if you have to read k, then your graph has a separator of size at most k plus 1, but then all your subgraphs, uh, by looking at uh, the induced uh, decomposition on them, and they will have uh, separators of size at most k plus 1 as well. And now, if conversely you have a graph that has the property that 
It has a small separator, separator of size at most k, and all its subgraphs have also small separators, size at most k, then it turns out that the fluid is at most constant times k, 15 times k. And so that's a theorem of, of uh, stanek borjak and Sergei Norin. So, you know, if you make sure to close undertaking subgraphs, then having small tree width and small separators up to a constant factor, this is, this is capturing the same thing. Right, so it's good to have that in mind um, when we think about separators. All right, so why do I say all of this? Because we are going to look at planograms. And we, you all know, we all know that planograms have root and size uh, separators. Right? That's one of the basic facts proved by Lipton and Tajan a long time ago. We are going to see how to deduce that. Um, a more um, precise statement about planar graphs is the so-called <coughs> Baker layering technique. So the, the, the lipton tarsian separators have been used, used in countless of settings, and typically they are used in a divide and conquer approach. Right, so you take a separator, you recurse on each connected component, or you recurse on each side if you take two sides. That depends on whatever you try to do. And then Baker introduced a kind of refinement of this approach, um, which allows to do some things that you cannot really do quick, directly with separators. So the, the idea is the following. So this is, again, a very classical thing. You take your planar graph, look at a nice uh, drawing in the plane, and then you peel off the vertices of, uh, the, uh, on the other face. Um, Iteratively, right? So the first layer of your layering would be all the vertices on the other face. You remove them and you recurse, right? This will be all the vertices on the other face after you remove the green ones, etc., etc. Right? So this gives you some some notion of layering of your planar graph. And uh, a basic fact, which is not difficult to prove, is that if you look at um, a constant number of consecutive layers, then you have bounded tree width. More precisely, the tree width grows linearly at most with the number of consecutive layers you look at. So if you look at L consecutive layers, you can show that the tree width is at most 3L roughly. Um, so it's big O of L, that's what we are going to use. Okay, and this allows to, to use another type of strategy. And the typical uh, strategy when you try to apply Baker's technique is to choose some number k, some parameter k. And this can be a constant, this can be a function of uh, the number n of vertices. This depends on what you're trying to do. But you have some parameter k for Baker's technique. And what you do is, you know, you remove all layers that are numbered i mod k. Right, so let's do that for k equal to 3 and let's say i equal to 1. So I remove all layers that are uh, numbered 1 mod k, um, 1 mod 3 in this case, so I'm left with this. And so what you see is that every component, connected component that is left after you remove those selected layers, every connected component that is left lives in uh, a bunch of at most k consecutive layers. Okay. But if a connected component lives in k consecutive layers, it means that that connected component has to be the big O of k, because k consecutive layers have to be big O of k. Now the tree width of a graph is the maximum tree width of its connected components. So it means that after you remove these selected layers, you have to read big O of k. Right? Every connected component has to read big O of k, so the whole graph has to read big O of k. Right, so when you remove these selected layers, you're left with a graph of three big O of k. And now typically the idea is to you know, choose uh, in, the, in the right way which layers you are going to, rem to remove. So choose this number i in, uh, in the right way. And often uh, a good choice is to try to, minimi to minimize the number of vertices you're removing. So by pigeonhole, there is a choice of i so that you're removing at most n over k vertices. And, uh, and that, that's often a good choice. So you remove at most n over k vertices, and then you're left with a graph 
with really big off key. And well, depending on the type of problems you are trying to solve, that could be a good strategy. There are countless of applications of this. Uh, for instance, like a, a very classical one is uh, to, the, uh, to get an approximation algorithm to compute a maximum size independent set in a planar graph. Um, and, and in that case, you can take k to be uh, about log n. So why can you take k to be about log n? Well, you know, after you remove your initial set of vertices, you're left with a graph of two with big O of k, so big O of log n. But if you know the standard uh, approach uh, to solve maximum independent set on bounded trivet graph, you don't really need the trivet to be bounded. You, you can even have a uh, trivet uh, order of log n. Because in, in the DP, you're just going to deliberate subsets of, of vertices of a bag. So you're, you can go up to log n. Right? So you can, you can take to be a, a k to be about log n. And so how many vertices are you removing? Well, you are removing at most n over, k, n over log n vertices in this case. You just throw them away, and then you compute optimally a maximum independent set in what's left. But you know, by the four color theorem, every in maximum independent set has size at least n over four. So it's linear in n, and you're just removing n over log n vertices, so you're not losing much. So you get a pretty good uh, approximation algorithm, where the, the approximation in fact is like one minus constants over log n. Right, so this is like a complete uh, standard of application of Baker's technique, but it's an example of something that is not at all obvious how to achieve uh, with separators. So with separators, you can get an approximation algorithm for maximum independent sets in planar graphs, which is NP hat by the way, um, to compute, uh, but you don't get such a good approximation algorithm. Anyways, so that's the Baker's technique, one of these basic fact, basic techniques about. Uh, uh, planar graphs. And Baker's layerings, this will reappear in this talk, uh, in this lecture a couple of times, so that's why I wanted to emphasize it a bit. But the first thing I wanted to say is that, well, in some sense, Baker's technique, this is a refinement of Lipton tangent. It's not just two distinct things. You can see Baker's technique as something which is more precise than uh, the separator result of Lipton and tangent, because it implies it for the right choice of k. So it, uh, it turns out that if you take k to be root n, then you are going to get back your root n size separators. And why do you have that? Well, you take k to be root n, so how many vertices are you removing in this first phase? You are removing n over k vertices at most, so that's n over root n, so that's root n, at most vertices. Um, so you remove these at most root n vertices, and you're left with a graph of trivial big O of root n. As we've just seen before, if you have trivial big O of root n, you have a separator of size big O of root n. Okay, so in the, re in, in the remaining graph, take a separator of size big O of root n. Now, in that separator, add all the vertices that you removed in the first phase. That's root n vertices. You still have a set of size big O of root n, and that's a separator of the, of the original graph. Right, so the, the point I'm trying to convey here is that if you take k to be root n, you, you, you somehow fall back to, uh, to Lipton tangent. But you know, there are other choices of k that, uh, that make sense as well. So in this sense, Baker's technique is really a refinement of uh, the separators, of the root n size separators of the graphs. Is this clear so far? Yeah? OK. So, in, in turn, you can see the product structure as a refinement of Baker's technique. So this, so, you know, this is a different viewpoint from the one I was trying to convey on Monday. You can see product structure as like an evolution of this chordal partition with small flatness, but you can also see it as a refinement of uh, Baker's technique. And why is that? Well, take your product structure for your planar graph. Right? So then your planar graph leaves in as a subgraph uh, of a bounded trivial graph times the path, right? And now you look at uh, this uh, product here, you have a natural notion of layers, right? Just order, say, from top row to bottom row in your product, and each row will be a layer, right? So the, the, there is this natural notion of layering. And do we have the property that we have in Baker's technique? 
Well, if we just look at a single row, what do we have? We have a copy of the graph H that we started with, and that's a graph of bounded tree grid. Now, if we take L consecutive rows in your product, what you're doing is you're actually taking L consecutive copies of H with the edges in between in your product. Right? But all these copies and they are set up in, in a very, very nice way. And it's, such, it's so rigid that when you have a 2D composition of H, it can be extended in an obvious way to a 3D composition of you know, L consecutive copies of, of H. And what, how does the, 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 the width change? Well, imagine that in your 2D composition of H, every bag had size at most 9. To take a concrete example, that's what we get from, uh, from the product structure theorem, the, the first version at least. That's why you have to read 8, because every bag has size at most 9. And now this can be lifted to a 3D composition of L consecutive rows, so that every bag has size at most 9 times L. Right, and then the, that graph has to read at most 9L minus 1. Okay, the point here, I mean, the 9 is not important. The point is that if you take L consecutive rows, you have to read big O of L. <laughs> so there is a notion of layering of your vertices. It's a bit more abstract as a layering because you're not using the, the embedding directly, but you have a, a layering which does exactly the same job as uh, Baker's layering. So, like, informally, I would say that this gives a Baker layering uh, as well. It's not the same, but it, it, it does give one. So in this sense, you can think of product structure as a refinement of Baker's technique in turn. So that's another way of seeing it. Yes, there is a question. Uh, yeah, so I am wondering about not very important thing, mm -hmm. namely a polynomial factor. So uh, this is about, uh, uh, is it guaranteed that there is a product such that it has linear size. I mean, uh, if the um, uh, if my planar planar graph has size n, and mm -hmm. I know that the, both the green and the orange uh, graphs have also size of most n, but uh, yes. a priori the product could have size like n squared. Okay. Yes, that's a good question, and actually we don't know how to do better than n squared. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, indeed, yeah, so that's a good point, so maybe let me try to repeat it. So Wojtek's question is, say that you have an n vertex planar graph. Then look at the choice of H and P that is given by the product structure theorem. Clearly, you can assume that H has at most n vertices and that P has at most n vertices. Right, because how do you get H? You get it as a minor of your planar graph. And how do you get P? Well, you have these BFS layers, right? So each one will have at most n vertices. But then when you take the product of these two, you have like, possibly n squared vertices. So Wojtek's question is, well, you know, can you try to, to be smart about the choices of H and P so that in the product you have much less than n squared vertices? We don't know how to do anything which is subquadratic. So that's, uh, yes, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, the, the, the consequence is that uh, why mm, it gives a, a bit slower average with a bit worse polynomial factor. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yes, yes. I'm not saying that this should replace Baker's theory completely. <laughs> that, that's a good point. Yes. But in terms of having like tribute big O of L for L consecutive rows, that uh, that actually is, uh, is, uh, is enough. Yes, indeed. Okay, if there are no more questions, let me, uh, let me continue. Okay, so that's what I wanted to, to state first. Uh, product structure implies some Baker layering um, in turn. And now before moving to some of the applications I want to, uh, to cover with you today, let me mention that uh, a bound and the product structure term has been improved recently. So in, in the two lectures on Monday and Tuesday, we've seen these two statements. The first one is that if you have a planar graph, it's a subgraph of H times P, where H has to read at most eight. And the second one is 
It's a subgraph of h times p times a triangle where h has three width at most three. Right? And uh, the, f the first theorem was derived from the proof of the second theorem. And as we've seen in the, the applications yesterday, if you really want to optimize the bounds, you use the second version. Right? So the typical setup is that if you just want to show that something is bounded, you, you, you go for the easiest version, so the first one. But if you want to optimize the bounds, typically, you, you use the second one because you have a better bound on true. But still, it's a good question, you know, it's a valid question at least. What is the best bound that you can get in the first version? When you just look at h times p, what is the best bound on the tribute of h that you can have? And uh, recently, uh, these authors improved the h to 6. And the way they did it uh, is by running the, the same proof that we've seen on, on Monday, but you know, try to be a bit more uh, efficient on how to build the 3D composition and also on how to choose the Sperner triangle. Turns out that you have some freedom there, and you know, if, if, you, if you make the right choices, you can shave off two in the Turing bound. Um, so, okay, so this improves the bound from eight to six, and there are examples that show that this bound needs to be at least three. So the, the, the yes, there is a question. Um, for the second version, um, is it clear that Okay, so three with three cannot be improved. Uh, so that's um, uh, this comes from stack triangulations. Uh, so the, the second version, yes, for the second version, you cannot improve the three here. This is tied. However, we don't know if we need this. We don't know if we need to take the product with the triangle. So it could be that this theorem is true without taking. The, the, the product with the triangle. And this would be equivalent to saying that well, the first theorem can be, the bound can be lowered down all the way to three. Or it, the, it could be that the truth is some intermediate status. It could be that, you know, this theorem can be improved, but here you have a K2 instead of K, a K3. Uh, I have no idea what, what's the right, uh, what right answer. So, yes, so pos Possibly these two results can be improved in some way, but the second one, the only way you can improve it is by somehow uh, improving this part. Yes, Bartek? And if you allow larger clicks of some constant size, you still cannot improve the 3 with 3. Um, if I remember well, yes. Yes. Yes, that, that's a very good question, but yes. Yes, there is no way to go to 3 with 2. Unfortunately. Right, okay, so in the first version you can get the bound from 8 down to 6. And that's nice because you know it would be nice to know what's the truth there. And in particular, if the truth is 3, then that would imply uh, uh, improved bounds for some of the applications. Unfortunately, if you don't get a number here which is 3, if you get bigger than 3, in all applications I know, it's still better to use the second version. Right? So, so far it does not like, yield uh, improved bounds for the applications, but it's, uh, I think it's still a, a natural question to look at. Okay, so that's uh, one improvement I wanted to mention. Now, let me turn to some uh, applications. As I already mentioned, I want you know, to give more like a, an overview, so I want to really tell you about the proofs. Uh, we are going to look at this version in the exercise session, actually. So the first version, the first application is about P-centered colorings. So, okay, the definition is on the slide, but let me maybe introduce it it's slightly differently. By first looking at what a centered coloring is, so without the P. So what is a centered coloring? That's a vertex coloring uh, with the following property, that whenever you look at some connected subgraph in your graph, there should be a color in your coloring that appears exactly once on these vertices. That's the notion of a centered coloring, right? So whenever you look at the connected subgraph of your graph and you look at the colors of these vertices in your connected subgraph, 
there should be a color that, uh, that appears exactly once. Okay, that's centered coloring. And for those of you that are familiar with tree depth, the minimum number of colors in the centered coloring, this is the same as tree depth. That's one way to define uh, tree depth. Now, the idea of P centered colorings is somehow to define a family of graph invariants that somehow relax tree depth. That, are, that give you lower bounds on tree depth, and when you increase p and you let p go to infinity, you, you get tree depth back. That's really the idea behind these invariants, and this can be used in, in various applications. Okay, so now let's look at the definition, now that we know what the motivation is. So p-centered coloring is again a vertex coloring of your graph, but now you have a parameter p, which is some uh, positive integer, and the condition is that whenever you look at a connected subgraph of your graph, Either you see a color that is used exactly once for the vertices in your connected subgraph, like before, or if that's not the case, then you should see a lot of colors, more than P. Right? So you allow a second outcome so that you relax a bit the condition, and this potentially uh, make it possible to use less co uh, colors. Okay, so that's a P centered coloring, and then you define the P centered chromatic number as the num minimum number of colors in p-centered coloring. And as I already mentioned, now if you let p tends to infinity, you go back to centered coloring, so you go back to trillet. Right, so you have this increasing family of uh, parameters. And this theorem of Michal and Sebastian that I mentioned on Monday, which is really at the root of the product structure theorem, uh, their theorem was given any planar graph you can partition the vertices into global geodesics so that the quotient graph has true at most eight. So they developed that theorem actually to bound the p-centered chromatic number of planar graphs. So that was their motivation, and that was the first application of their result. Um, uh, and they got a polynomial bound, p, p to, the, to the 19. And before that, it was known that planar graphs have uh, bounded p-centered chromatic numbers for every p. So bounded by a function of p, but the bound was not polynomial in p. Uh, so if, by the way, if you know about classes with bounded expansion, uh, classes with bounded expansion, that they can be characterized in terms of the p-centered chromatic numbers. These are exactly the, the monotone graph classes for which the p-centered chromatic numbers are bounded by some function of p. That's one way to characterize bounded expansion. Uh, but for planar graphs, you have a, a polynomial bound. And now it turns out that you know, if, you, if, you be, if you are more careful and you try to use the tripod decomposition that we've seen on Monday, then and if you are really careful in your bound, you can get down to p q uh, log p. So in, in the exercise session, we are going to see part of how to get to this, uh, this bound. Uh, there is still a small gap left. Uh, we have an upper bound of p cube log p, and there are examples, namely stack triangulations. I mean, in this context, almost all the time, the bad examples are the stacked triangulations. Um, so the stacked triangulations, they achieve p squared log p uh, for the p center of chromatic number, and these are the worst examples that are known. So there, there is still some gap here. We don't know what is the truth, and this is quite similar to the gap for weak coloring numbers that Piotr mentioned yesterday in his lecture. So for weak coloring numbers, the, the upper bound for planar graph is RQ, and that you get from, uh, from uh, caudal partitions of planar graphs. But uh, the worst examples we know, they achieve R squared log R. So the, there is, a, there is a, a gap there. And it, I mean, it's not a... It's not a coincidence. I mean, weak coloring numbers, when you let R go to infinity, you go to tree depth as well. And so these are two ways of relaxing tree depth. They are, they are different. These are two different ways of relaxing tree depth, but they all they, 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 they behave similarly in many respects. OK, so that was one of the first applications of at least tripod decompositions. Um, let me mention another one. Okay, so the definition looks maybe a bit technical, but at least the intuition is not 
uh, too difficult. So it's called fractional tree depth fragility. That was introduced by, by Zdenek Vorjak and Jean-Sébastien Sereni a couple of years ago. And the idea is again to relax tree depth, but in yet another way. Right? So, so this will be a third way of relaxing tree depth. So recoloring numbers is a way to relax tree depth. P-centered chromatic numbers is a way. And now we have a fractional tree depth fragility. So how does it work? So you have some graph G, and then you have some positive integer A. And given a graph G and this integer A, now you are going to try, you are going to play the following game. You are going to create a probability distribution on the subsets of the vertices of your graph. Right? So on, on every vertex subset of your graph, you are going to uh, assign some probability to that subset. And what you want to achieve is that when you take a random subset uh, from your probability distribution, every vertex has a probability at most 1 over A to uh, be chosen. Right? So the probability of a vertex to be chosen should be small, should be at most 1 over A. Right? So if you increase A, then this probability should decrease. And the idea is that well, you, know, you, know, you take a random subset and then you remove it from the graph. And the second property you should achieve is that when you remove your, your random subset, you should have small tree width. And that's the bound that you're trying to optimize. Oh, uh, sorry, not small tree width, small tree depth. It's about tree depth here. Right? So you, re you take a random subset and when you remove it, you should have small tree depth. So in other words, for every subset, X of vertices that has uh, non-zero probability, it should be the case that when you remove X, you have uh, tree depth at most some function of A and some function of your bra. Right, so and this, this is the number that you're trying to minimize. That depends on it. Okay. Does the definition make sense? So, okay, how to get intuition about this? We are going to do an exercise about it. So. Uh, hopefully, if you the exercise, you will have more intuition. But the idea is, you know, to, to relax what it means to have bounded tree depth, right? So if you have a graph of bounded tree depth, then, well, you know, this, this is quite easy because you can just uh, assign all the mass of probability to the, to the empty set. <laughs> and then you have a, an absolute bound on the tree depth uh, of your graph. So you have it. So that's, that's easy. But, you know, there are graphs which do not have bounded tree depth, but yet they are somehow close to having small tree depth if you, know, if you remove a few vertices. And so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the spirit behind this definition. Um, so now you are going to say that a class of graphs, uh, well, to use their terminology, they call it fractionally tree depth fragile at rate f, where f is some function of a, if, you know, for every graph in your class and every positive integer a, this bound on the tree depth of g minus x, you can get it to be at most f of a. Right? And this includes uh, different examples, but what is interesting for us is that if you look at planar graphs, you do have a nice polynomial function of a that is bounding this uh, fractionality rate, Fra this fractionality tree depth fragility rate. Right, so planar graphs are fractionally tree depth fragile at rate uh, some a cube log a. And you see, you, you see again, same type of bounds as before, right? So this is the same bound as we had there. Uh, and this is not a surprise because again, this is a relaxation of tree depth. It's different from p of chromatic numbers. It's also different from weak coloring numbers. But still, there are many common properties between these invariants. And how do they prove this? They use tripod decomposition. Right? So it's, uh, they, they run the tripod decomposition for this parameter, and, and then they get that. And then the, the, the situation is again similar to the, pre the previous invariants, is that we, they have a upper bound of a cube log A. And the worst examples are these stack triangulations that achieve A squared log A and we don't know what is the truth. Right, 
so there is still a gap left. Yes, Martek? Has this probability distribution algorithmic, the one that gives a cube? Yes, yeah, so it's on a BFS recursive. Okay, so that was yet another application. So far, we've seen you know things that are quite that are somehow relaxations of tree depth. And before moving to the next one, I wanted to mention something since recurring numbers have appeared uh, already um, uh, a lot in uh, Piot's talk. If you remember, for recurring numbers, uh, for the R recurring number, so when you bound the distance at most R, for planar graphs, the best known upper bound is not R squared log R, but R squared. So you might wonder, okay, why don't we have the extra log here? And so that's a, just a tiny comment here. Well, it turns out that for recurring numbers, if you if you use chordal partitions of planar graphs, this is enough to bound the recurring numbers, and you get a cubic bound. So these chordal partitions of planar graphs that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture on Monday, right? And you rem if you remember the exercise session from yesterday. We did the corresponding proof for the strong correct numbers. And I told you, we, you know, if you run the same proof and you, you are careful, you, you get a cubic bound for the weak correct numbers. But it turns out that these caudal partitions, they don't, they don't seem to work. At least we don't know how to make them work to bound the p-centered chromatic number. And we don't know how to use them to bound a uh, uh, fractional tree depth fragility rate. Right? So for these two applications, somehow you really need this uh, tripod decomposition. But now, conversely, you could try to use tripod decompositions to bound the recurring numbers. If you do that, there is a standard proof, and you get R cube log R. So if you do use the same techniques as for these two theorems, you get actually the same bound. You get R cube log R. It's just that, well, for recurring numbers, there is a better way that shifts of one log R factor. OK, that's a small comment, but so that you have at least a picture of the situation here. Okay, let me move on to another application, and now it will be a bit different. Um, <coughs> so this one, I'm really not going to go into much detail. I just want to mention it. So it's about vertex rankings. So it's again some notion of uh, vertex coloring of your graph, and you again have a parameter here. It's a parameter L. L will be at least two. So it's some integer at least two. And the game is as follows. So you want to color the vertices, let's say with positive integers, so that your colors are ordered. Uh, and the game is as follows. Whenever you look at a path of length between 1 and L in your graph, so you're looking at the path of length at most L, and for me, the length of a path is the number of edges. right? And it should be of length at least 1. right? So you have, you have at least two vertices on your path. So whenever you look at such a short path in your graph, one of the following two things should happen. Either the endpoints of your path have different colors, in which case you're happy, or if that's not the case, then if the two endpoints have the same color, then when you look at the internal vertices of your path, you should see a vertex there whose color is bigger than the endpoints. So that means your EK in the last expression is EK minus 1. Yes, yes indeed. But it's true in this in this case as well, right? Oh, because like the, the like oh yes the yes, 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 indeed, you you're completely correct. So, um, so this should be a pk minus one. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> so um, so now again, you can use tripod decompositions, and you can get. That for every fixed L, you have uh, um, for planar graphs, you have an L vertex ranking uh, with log n over log 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 n colors, and it turns out that this is uh, best possible up to constant factor, and you know this might seem like a weird bound. So there was a log n upper bound before, and again I'm not going into any details here, but just to give you a tiny bit of intuition, this log 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 n, this is log iterated three times. This tree comes from tree with tree when uh, you look at the product structure coming from tripod decomposition. 
So if instead of having this graph h that had tribute 3, you had tribute 9, you would have log iterated 9 times in, in the bar. Okay, so that's, uh, that's yet another application, and you get a, a tight bound in this way. Okay, let's move on to yet another application. <laughs> uh, tweet width. That's obviously a huge topic. Uh, quite a few experts on twin read here. And uh, I'm, you know, maybe I will just mention what, what is the definition in case you haven't seen it. Uh, let, let me advertise uh, Shimon's talk today at 4.15, which will be about twin width of ordered graphs. So if you want to hear more about twin width, that's a perfect opportunity. Okay, so what is twin width? Well, you are playing the following game. Um, you have a graph, and then you are going to reduce your graph using identification of pairs of vertices, and you are going to reduce it to a single vertex graph. And when you identify two vertices, they don't need to be adjacent. It's fine to identify non-adjacent vertices. We are not taking minus here. We are just making vertex identifications. Right? But then, the game is the following, so that when at some point you identify u and v, and I don't care if they are adjacent or not. You look at their common neighborhood in the current graph, but you also look at their private neighbors. Maybe you have one private neighbor there. Maybe you have two private neighbors for v. So, so by private neighbors, I mean neighbors that are vertices that are neighbor of exactly one of u and v. And now when you do the identification, You replace u and v by a single vertex. You still have their common neighborhood here. But then you also have the private neighbors of u and v as neighbors. But the, the edges going to these private neighbors, you call them red. Right? So when you identify u and v, create a single vertex resulting from the identification, and then you, you, the edge is going to form a private neighbor, so you color them right. And you keep going, you know, and you read, yes? So if any edge was originally red, it, it stays red? Yes, that's a, a good point, thanks. Edges that are red stay yeah. uh, red as well. Right. So formally, we are playing with trine graphs here, but I'm, I'm being quite uh, informal here. And the, the, the goal is uh, to find a reduction sequence of your graph so that every vertex at all times has a small red degree. So you count for every vertex how many red edges are incident to it, and you want to minimize this, uh, this maximum number of uh, red edges incident to it. Right? So if you can make it so that you always have at most k red edges incident to every vertex at every time, then you have twin width at most k. And twin width is the minimum that you can achieve. Okay, that's, uh, as I mentioned, super important parameter, lots of connections with many other stuff. Um, why do I mention twin width in this context? It's because, well, tenograss have bounded twin width. That's, one, uh, that's in the first paper about uh, twin width. The original proof does not give you an explicit bound, and the bound is at least 2 to the 1,000. It's, it's a pretty big bound. But it turned out, and people realized quickly, I think, that there seems to be similarities between twin width and Q numbers, somehow. Like, at least at a very high level, it seems that you know techniques that are good for one of the two parameters, they sometimes end up being good for the other parameter. That's very vague, but that seems to be an intuition. And now, if you remember yesterday's lecture, you know, how do we bound Q numbers for planar graphs? We use product structure, right? So it's natural, you know, to try and get a good bound on twin width of planar graphs by using the same tools. And that has been done by uh, three different set of authors. Um, and each time it's the same, uh, same approach, 
use the tripod decomposition that we've seen on Monday, try to be smart about how you produce your reduction sequence, and you get a good bound. Right? So the first bound that was uh, obtained in this way was 583, then it was quickly reduced by Hugo Jacob and Martin Lipschuk to 183, and was quickly again reduced to uh, 37. And if I didn't miss any uh, recent paper, so this one is from like three weeks ago, I think. I think 37 is the current uh, record. Okay, so the, the, the point here is that the, the approach, they all, all these proofs, they rely on, on, uh, on this tripod decomposition and, and exploiting it to bound the twin ring. Yes? Are there any lower bounds known? I'm sure there are. I don't know them. <laughs> and I, I bet there is a big gap. <laughs> but I, I, there are some experts on twin width here, so maybe someone can answer that. No? Okay. Okay, I'll look it up then. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So if there are no questions on twin width, on this application, let me move on to... Okay, now I will move on to extensions of the product structure theorem. Let me have a look at the time. Okay. So, so far we focused on planar graphs, right? It was always about planar graphs, what can we say about planar graphs, and how can we use that, you know, to, to bound some graph invariants on planar graphs. So we focused completely on planar graphs. But then it's naturally, you know, to ask what other what are other uh, classes of graphs that can be uh, that can have for which we can state the product structure theorem? And by a product structure theorem, I mean you know your graph is a subgraph of some h of bounded tree width times a path, for instance, or maybe h times a path times a clique if you want, but something like that. And the, the first thing you can do is you can show that this holds for graphs on surfaces. Right, so if you have a graph that is drawn on the surface of Euler genus G, uh, by, what do I mean by Euler genus G? Well, if you have a sphere with G handles, Euler genus is 2G. If you have a sphere with uh, G cross caps, Euler genus is G. So if you have a graph which is embedded on the surface of Euler genus G, then it's a subgraph of the strong product of H and P, where P is a path, as always, and H has small trivial as a function of the genus at most 2g plus 8. This plus 8, of course, you can replace by plus 6 with the improved version. Uh, and then there is a second version where you allow some clique uh, as well, and then you can get your graph H to have 3 with at most 4. So H has 3, 4 times a, P, times a path times some clique which essentially has size 2g, when well, g is at least 2. Okay, um, I'm not going to do the proof. Maybe I'm just trying to. I will just try to convey an intuition of why this should be true. The proof is actually quite ugly, in my opinion. Uh, but at least there is an intuition of why this should be true. The intuition is that you can show a lemma, which is the following: that if you if you, uh, if, you are, if you have the graph which is on your surface, and if you look at uh, a BFS layering of your graph, then you can actually find some subgraph, let's call it Z, can find a subgraph of your graph which is connected and that subgraph contains at most 2G vertices in each BFS layer. So Z is connected, Z contains at most 2G vertices in each layer, and now the last property is that when you remove the vertices in Z, you get a planar graph. 
Okay, so this is not a new lemma. This was known under different forms for, for since a long time. But that, that's somehow the, the, the high level reason of why you can lift this theorem to, to bounded genus. So you can, in every graph on the surface, you can, if you take any BFS layering, you can find a connected subgraph which hits each layer only a few times, at most 2G times in terms of number of vertices. And yet, when you remove the, ver the vertices that are in Z, you get a planar graph. Right, so globally, your subgraph Z could be big, you know, you don't have a bound on the number of vertices in Z, but you can control how many vertices you have uh, in each DFS layer. And now the intuition to lift the product structure theorem from planar graphs to bounded genus is, well, you take such a Z, you remove it from your graph, you have product structure for the resulting planar graph, and you try to add back Z to it using the fact that, you know, on each BFS layer, you only have a few vertices, right? And then you try to hide the vertices of Z in this clip here. That's the intuition, okay? Unfortunately, it, yes, but and Is this why the two weeks grows by one? Um, so the, the tree width grows by one for, uh, for a reason that we were not very um, making the proof in an optimal way and actually it turns out that you can avoid the growth by one and you can get back the bound tree, yes. Um, so the way we did it was not optimal in the original paper and for some like kind of stupid technical reason, we pay a um, uh, plus one in the three week bound. But clearly this should have been avoided and this can be avoided as was done by these authors who did it more carefully. Uh, but okay, so the intuition is really that, you know, you remove the vertex set of Z, you go back to a graph, apply the product structure there, and then you, you put back Z inside your product structure and you simulate it as a product with a click. That's the intuition. Unfortunately, to make it work, we need a, a few extra ingredients. We need somehow that when you remove that, not only you have a planar graph, but this planar graph is contained into uh, a plane triangulation that has a rooted spanning tree, so that when you look at the vertical paths of your spanning tree, these vertical paths, they are contained into vertical paths of the initial uh, spanning tree of your graph on the surface, okay? That might seem a bit technical, but you, you do actually need an extra property to make it work. And so that's what, that's what, uh, that will, this is what makes this proof a bit uh, annoying. But I mean, this captures really the intuition of why, why it works. Yes. So the idea is somehow get back to planar graphs and, uh, and then lift it back to uh, bounded genus using the fact that your Z only uses a few vertices in each PFS layer. Does it make sense at this uh, high level? Yeah? Okay, so uh, as Bartek, uh, following the question of Bartek, indeed this bound of four on the tree width here is not tight, and you can improve it to three, and three is tight. We don't know if 2G here is best possible, uh, but that's what we get from, from the proof. Okay, so graphs on surfaces have a product structure theorem. That's nice because then all the applications that you have where you only use the product structure theorem, they apply to graphs on surfaces. And well, you have a dependency on the genus, but uh, yeah. So in particular, you have bounded Q numbers, bounded non-repetitive chromatic numbers, and so on. Okay, so how, how far can we go in this uh, direction? Well, you can generalize graphs on surfaces and there are different ways of generalizing it. If you take the point of view of graph minor theory, one way to generalize graphs on surfaces is to forbid an apex graph as a minor. So what is an apex graph? That's a graph which is either planar or close to being planar in the sense that by removing one vertex, there is a choice of a vertex that you can remove so that you get a planar graph. So you are at distance of at most one from being planar in terms of vertex removal. But so what is a canonical example of an apex graph which is not planar is take 
a big grid, and now add a universal vertex. Right? Let's call that a, a pyramid. Right? This is definitely highly non-planar. Lots of crossings, whatever way you try to, uh, to uh, draw it. But it's apex because you just remove that vertex and you become planar. Right? Now, if you know a little bit about oilogenous, you know that these pyramids, they have uh, oilogenous that grow with their size. Uh, so they, they have unbounded oilogenous. So if you look at a fixed surface, and you look at the graph that you can embed in your surface, you are definitely excluding some pyramid. And you are excluding uh, a pyramid as a minor, because the graph that you can draw on your surface, this is a minor closed class. Right, so if you can draw any graph on the surface, you can draw all its minors. Okay, so graphs on surfaces, they exclude some apex graph as a minor, they exclude some pyramid. But now, you know, if you want to generalize the notion of uh, graphs on surfaces, you can just ask, what happens if I just exclude an apex graph as a minor? That's a proper minor closed class, and this is more abstract than just graphs on surfaces. Um, and, but still, this is something that, that, is, that has been studied a lot. There are structure theorems uh, for these classes. In particular, there is a very precise one due to Zdenek Dvorak and Robin Thomas. And, and using these structure theorems and using uh, what we have for graphs on surfaces, it turns out that you can lift the product structure theorem to to this setting. So if you form it any apex graph as a minor, you have a product structure theorem. The tree width of your graph H is some function of the apex graph that you form it as a minor. Okay? I'm, I'm not going to say much about the proof, uh, especially because I have only 20 minutes left, but um, the idea is to use the the graph structure theorem, graph, uh, the structure theorem that I alluded to for apex minor free graphs, and for those of you that know a bit of graph minor theory, the idea is that these graphs they can be built uh, using the click sum operations, so gluing on clicks and then possibly removing some edges from some basic blocks, and these basic blocks they are almost embeddable on a surface of bounded Euler genus. Almost embeddable means you know most of the graph can be drawn on the surface but you have some extra noise, and this extra noise is a bounded number of vortices, uh, and these vortices have bounded width. And you have also some apex vertices, but these apex vertices, uh, they are only adjacent to vertices in the, in the apex set and in the vortices. They are not adjacent to vertices which are elsewhere on the surface. Okay, so if you don't know much about graph minor theory, don't worry about it. This is just a, a parenthesis that I'm making. But the point is that these apex minor free graphs, they have a very special structure. So there is the click sum operation, but the basic pieces, they are really close to being graphs on surfaces in some sense. And in particular, thanks to the structure theorem, we avoid the situation of having a vertex in the apex set that is linked to many vertices on the surface. That doesn't happen in the structure theorem. Yes. So can an apex be attached to many vortices? Yes. But you only have a bounded number of vortices. Yeah. But the vortices, they live on, uh, on different faces of your, of your graph on, on your surface. And an apex vertex can be linked to arbitrary vertices in the, in the vortices. And they can be linked to other uh, vertices in the apex set. But that's it. They cannot be linked to anything else. So you cannot build a pyramid. That's somehow the idea. But the idea is that it's exactly that. In this structure theorem, there is no way to build a pyramid. Because if you build a pyramid, you, are, you will have to put this in the apex set. And this, you know, you cannot hide it in the vortex. Because the, your vortex has bounded width, so you will have to put most of your grid in the, in the surface, but then you cannot have these connections. So the, somehow the idea is really that the structure theorem tells you, well, these pyramids, they, they don't show up. And because these pyramids don't show up, you can have a product structure theorem. Okay, very vague, but that's the intuition. So you can lift a product structure theorem to this setting where you forbid uh, an apex graph as a minor. And now you could say, well, okay, uh, nice, but 
what's special about forbidding an apex graph as a minor? Can we hope for such a theorem if you forbid any graph as a minor? Right? I don't know. Like forbid K10 as a minor, complete graph on 10 vertices, do I have a product structure theorem? And the answer is no. If you forbid a if you forbid a graph which is not apex as a minor, then you don't have a product structure theorem. Right? So in terms of what are the proper minor closed classes that have a product structure theorem? Well, you do have a product structure theorem if and only if you exclude some apex graph as a minor. Right? So if you exclude one, you do have one. And if you don't exclude an apex graph, you don't have a product structure theorem. And the reason is, again, pyramids. Why? Well, if whatever you are excluding is not apex, then you look at your class of graphs, and then it will contain all apex graphs. Right? So you're looking at a minor closed class. If what you for forbid is not apex, then you will contain all apex graphs in your class. Right? So if you forbid, I don't know, like uh, K10, then you will have all apex graphs in your class. But in particular, you will have all pyramids in your class. Okay? And just having pyramids, this forbids any kind of uh, product structure. Why? Well, imagine that you could somehow have a product structure for pyramids. So that's your graph G, and this is contained somehow in the subgraph of H, uh, as a subgraph in H times P, where H has bounded through it. But your pyramid, you know, it has, you know, diameter uh, two, <laughs> right? It has very small diameter. So as a subgraph, your pyramid will live in like at most three consecutive rows of your product, right? Because you have tiny diameter. Yes? I assume with uh, graph class as not a mid um, product structure, you mean that it's not the subgraph of uh, H times P? Yes. Um, yes. For H? Yes. Yes. Um, do similar results hold if we say um, lose these conditions somehow, maybe not take a path, but a bound degree tree or something? Mm -hmm. yes. Um, right, bounded degree tree, I don't know. Or anything else which maybe makes more sense. Mm -hmm. So one thing, you, one thing you could do is, instead of taking the strong product with the path once, you could like repeat this a few times, <laughs> constant number of times. And uh, this won't change the fact that you don't have a product structure. Okay. Uh, but with a bounded uh, degree tree, I, I don't know actually. So that's a good question. Okay, I, I will think about it. I don't know. Okay, so just to, to go back to pyramids, they don't have a product structure in the sense that there are subgraphs of H times P where H has bounded tree with, because if they if that was the case, then your pyramid would live in at most three consecutive uh, rows of your product. But three consecutive rows, that's a graph of bounded tree width. And your pyramid does not have bounded tree width, it has a huge grid. Right. So, so, so pyramids are like the canonical obstruction to having a product structure in this sense. Right? So in terms of proper minor closed classes, this is the end of the story. You, you have a product structure if you forbid an apex graph as a minor, and you don't if you form it something else. All right. Uh, now, let's go back to Q numbers. So, of course, whenever you have a, a product structure theorem, you have a bound for, for Q numbers, you have a bound for non-repetitive chromatic numbers, and, and so on. You can look at all your applications. So it's definitely bounded if your Q number is definitely bounded if you forbid an apex graph as a minor because you directly have a product structure. But you know, for some parameters, it turns out that you can go a bit higher. So it turns out that if you forbid any graph as a minor, so if you look at proper minor closed class, you don't have a pro product structure there. But still, you know, you can show that you have a bound on the Q number. And the idea is, well, if you forbid any graph as a minor, there is the robinson seymour uh, graph minor structure theorem, which tells you uh, a decomposition of your graph, uh, and 
Essentially, it shows that your graph can be built using click sums from some pieces. These pieces are almost embeddable graphs, but the problem is that these almost embeddable graphs now they have a, a pieces, apex vertices that can be linked to anything, especially things that are on the surface. But for Q numbers, these annoying pieces you can somehow just there are only bounded number of them, and you know you can uh, they, they will only uh, lead to a constant increase in the size of a rainbow. So the, the, the intuition is that somehow you can pretend that these apices are not there. They can be handled easily for Q numbers. And, and then you're in the setup where you essentially don't have these ap uh, apices. And that's essentially what's happening when you forbid an apex graph as a minor. And then we have a product structure. So the idea is, you know, you know, clean up a bit the picture and then you fall back to uh, a situation where you actually uh, have a product structure and then you lift this back using the robertson simo uh, decomposition. Okay, and I'm very vague. If you don't know graph minor theory, this probably doesn't make sense. That's, that's fine. That's completely fine. What I'm trying to convey here is that for some problems, not all, you know, you can go from apex minor 3 to any uh, excluded minor if your parameter is nice enough. Okay, that's true the case for non for uh, Q numbers. It's also the case for non-repetitive colorings. Uh, a similar situation holds. You can uh, uh, somehow uh, clean up the problem and follow the same strategy. Actually, for non-repetitive chromatic numbers, you can even go further using uh, a structure theorem uh, decomposition for graphs for building a fixed graph as a topological minor. You can also show that they have non-repetitive chromatic number bounded by some function of what you, you forbid. Okay, so that was a comment about these two uh, parameters. Now let me look at yet another uh, setup and yet another problem. Uh, here it's not what I'm going to talk about is is not an application of product structure in the strict sense. Uh, I will explain why in a minute, but still there are some connections, so that's why I wanted to mention it. Um, <clears throat> so there is an old result of Ding and Oporowski, uh, which says that if you have bounded tree width, then you have tree partition width big O of the maximum degree, whatever tree partition width is. Well, I, I'm not going to give you the original definition of tree partition width, because now that we are familiar with strong products, this is exactly the same thing as saying that if you have bounded tree width, then your graph is a subgraph of the strong product of a tree and a click, where the click has size big O of delta. More precisely, if you have tree width k and maximum degree delta, then your subgraph of the strong product of a tree and a click of size uh, roughly at most 20 k delta. So in the original paper, the 20 was a bit bigger, and then uh, would improved the constant to 20. OK, so that's, a, that's an old result that can be phrased in terms of uh, strong products. And it has different applications. And one of them is to the so-called clustered colorings. So what's the game here? You have a graph. And you want to color the vertices of your graph, but you really want to use a very small number of colors, like two, three, four, tiny number of colors. And then, of course, it won't be a proper coloring. So you're not trying to get a proper coloring, but you, what you're trying to minimize is when you look at the color class and you look at the subgraph induced by that color class, you look at the connected components, you would like that these connected components, they are small. So in the proper coloring, you want these connected components to have to be singletons. Uh, here, we relax that and we just say, OK, every connected component of a color class has a small size. That's, that's the goal here. Right? So that's what we are going to measure, what's the maximum size of a monochromatic component. Uh, so what's the connection with the previous uh, result? Well, as was uh, noticed in this paper, if you apply this, this result on top, it directly implies that if you have a graph of bounded tree width, then you can two-color it so that every monochromatic component has size big O of the maximum degree. 
And when, how you do that? Well, apply the, the above result. So you have your graph G, which is contained in the strong product of a tree and a clique of size big of delta. Okay, now think of your tree. You can two color your tree, right? Now this two coloring induces a two coloring of the product of the tree with a clique. Just every node of the tree is blown up into a clique and you color them with the corresponding color. Okay? And now if you think of the monochromatic components you're going to get in that coloring, well, they will all be contained into, uh, into uh, one of these uh, sets of small sizes, so they will have a, a size big O of delta. It's a, it's a direct consequence of that. Okay, and somehow that's the starting point of a line of research, and where the question is, okay, if you have on the tree, that's nice, you can do it with two colors, and now you can wonder, okay, what are other classes that you can do with three, two colors or three colors? Or maybe you need four colors for some classes. And always the game is you want to uh, bound the size of your monochromatic component as a function of the maximum degree. And for penographs, well, you cannot do two colors for penographs. Obviously, you can do four colors because penographs can be four colors. <laughs> so there, the monochromatic components have size of most four. But you cannot do two colors uh, because of the hex lemma. So if you know the hex lemma, you take a triangulated grid. Okay, I'm not going to triangulate completely, but that's a triangulated grid. And the hex lemma says that if you color the vertices red and blue, uh, you will have a monochromatic path either from left side to right side or from uh, bottom to top. Okay? So in particular, it means that if you have a K by K grid, there is a monochromatic path of length at least of consisting of at least K vertices. Okay? So in terms of monochromatic components, whatever two coloring you take of a triangle grid, uh, there will be a big monochromatic component. Right? So two colors are not enough for, for, for planographs. Four colors are enough for planographs by the four color theorem. But also, you know, you don't need to invoke the four color theorem. If you don't want to use the four color theorem, this is actually pretty easy to see that four colors are enough if you allow some slightly uh, bigger components. And uh, the reason is that you can use Baker's technique. Remember Baker's technique? You have this parameter k, right? And now take k to be 2, right? So you have even layers and odd layers. Now if you look at the even layers in Baker's technique, this is a graph of a bounded tree width. If you look at odd layers in Baker's layering, that's a graph of bounded tree width as well. Now each, this partition the vertex set of your planar graph, right? So for the even graph and for the odd graph, in each case you can apply this and use two colors. Right? So you use two colors for the even graph, and then monochromatic components have size big of delta, and then you can do the same for the odd graph, and you use four colors in total. Of course, this is really far from being optimal because you can you can uh, you could apply the four color theorem, but you know that's a quick way of seeing that four colors are enough. And there was a question of can you do it with three colors? Turns out that you can do it with three colors. Uh, the, the original proof we had had a very bad uh, bound as a dependency on delta. Uh, so that was way before for the structured theorems. Uh, and then this bound got improved in a couple of papers. And I wanted to mention this very nice uh, uh, proof, very nice bound of these authors, including Bartek just there, uh, where they, they got it down to big O of delta squared. Right, so for penographs with three colors, you can get it down to delta squared. Um, and you know, it's close to being optimal. We don't know what's the truth. There are examples that achieve um, root delta. Uh, so the truth is between root delta and, and delta squared. And what they need to prove this, they don't need product structure to prove this. So it's not an application of product structure in the strict sense. What they need, they just need a Baker layering. Okay. So it's a really uh, an application of Baker layering. So why do I mention it here? It's because 
you can look at uh, uh, a more general setup where instead of looking at thinner graphs, you forbid a fixed graph as a minor. And you can ask, well, can you still do the same? Can you do a, a tricolor ring where every monochromatic component has size at most some function of the maximum degree? That is true. It was done by Liu and Um a few years ago. Again, the original bound was pretty bad, non-explicit. Uh, and in the, the same paper, they, they improved it to uh, delta to the 5. And again, the, bound, the, the proof only uses the fact that there is somehow a good uh, Baker layering for these graphs. But what they prove in this paper, they prove that actually you have a kind of product structure theorem there. So I just told you a few slides ago that if you forbid a fixed graph as a minor, you don't necessarily have a product structure. Uh, but it turns out that if you bring in the maximum degree, in some sense, you have a product structure if you allow the tree, the tree width to depend on the maximum degree. So more precisely, and that's why I wanted to mention this line of research, they prove that if you forbid a graph as a minor, then every graph in your class that has maximum degree delta, you can see it as a subgraph of the strong product of H and P, where H has to be big of delta. And the implicit constant C here will depend on the graph that you forbid as a minor. Right, so if, if you allow dependency on the maximum degree, then you do have uh, a product structure that, uh, that holds. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one of the things they, they proved in that paper, and that's what I wanted to mention. So I should really close in the last two minutes. So let me just mention that one last case where you have a product structure is when you look at Kipling graphs, graphs that can be drawn in the plane it's in such a way that each edge crosses at most k other edges. And it has been shown that in that case, uh, you have a product structure. And the interesting version is the following one, that um, they are contained in the product of h, p, and a clique, where h has to be roughly k cube, and the clique has size roughly k squared. And so if you take them, these two together, and you hide them, then you get a, in one graph, then you get a graph of three, k to the 5, if you prefer to just have one graph times a, a path. It's an open problem to know, to, dis, to, to decide whether in this version here, you can make it so that h has three bounded by a constant, independent of k. So maybe it could be that here you have a bound on the tree which is independent of k, and you hide all the dependency on k in the k. That could be the case, that's, a, that's an open problem. And for one planar graph, they optimize the bound, and they get it as a subgraph of h and p times a click on seven vertices, where h has uh, true tree. Okay, so this gives you kind of an overview of all the product structure theorems. The idea is always the same: reduce to planar graphs, lift back to whatever uh, class of graphs you were looking at. Okay, so thank you a lot for your attention.